Good afternoon, guys. Good to be with you once again. So we're going to pick up right where we left off last week in verse 3 of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. So allow me to read real quick, and then we'll, we'll commit our time to the Lord. Chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 3. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a good soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Let's pray and commit our time to the Lord real quick. Father, once again, we just want to, Lord, recognize who you are in our lives. Father, that you are the one who gives us your word. Father, in every word, there's a distinct purpose and meaning behind it. Father, as, as I was just discussing right now with, with Pastor Joe, and Lord, how words have meaning. They you use them, Father, in the right time, in the right place. And Father, as your word even says, in the fullness of time. Lord, you picked this Greek language, this original language that you wrote the scriptures into to teach us, Father, what exactly you are trying to say. And Father, as we go deeper into your word right now, the last words of Paul's life, Father, we ask that it would speak to us a fresh word. It would speak to us what you are trying to say, what you are trying to convey, and Lord, that we would just draw closer to you through it, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reason I bring up words in my prayer and the reason I talk about words here is that these are the last words of Paul. Remember, I don't want you to forget where Paul is at. Paul is in a Roman prison. He's chained up to a Roman guard. He's about to die for his faith. And he spends a few words or, or sentences here in this passage discussing three pictures of the Christian life. The soldier, the athlete, and the hardworking farmer. Now, I, even myself, when I first started walking the Lord, with the Lord, uh, I fell into this trap of just passing through these couple verses and thinking, oh, those, those are great pictures, those are great um, metaphors of what the Christian life is like, not really understanding the original language. That the original language behind these words is, is in the present tense, it's in the active voice, it's in the imperative mood in some of these words. And that last verse that we read, verse 7, is actually a command. It's not a suggestion. And so Paul is saying, I command you to meditate to to consider what i just said regarding the soldier the athlete and the farmer and and i say that in myself but like i told you in, in my own life as a christian sometimes or, or when i first started walking with the lord like i said i first read these words these verses and passed over them thinking that they sound great they sound wonderful they give me a good picture but they don't i didn't actually realize what they meant to my Christian life until I started considering them. And that's what Paul tells us here to do, consider them. And so I pray that as we get into this, we would consider what the Lord is actually trying to speak to us with these three pictures of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And so let's uh, go verse by verse and, and unpack it today. You therefore, verse 3, must endure hardship as a good soldier. That word hardship is, is the same verb that's used. It, 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 actually, the compound verb is used in, in the first chapter of verse 8 where he says, share with me in the sufferings of the gospel. It's the same word here that's used, that you will suffer hardship as a good soldier, that you will suffer ill treatment, that you may suffer persecution, but nonetheless, you will suffer. It's, it's not a foreign teaching from, from Paul. Paul talked about it in Acts 14 where he exhorted the church that through many tribulations you will enter the kingdom of heaven. This isn't a foreign concept in Scripture that the Christian will suffer. However, it is a foreign concept to our American church, to our Western culture. 
we have lived in a culture that, you know, well, in our American church, that kind of teaches the, the opposite of what Scripture teaches. In fact, there's a huge movement called the prosperity gospel. That if you come to Christ, you will receive all kinds of blessings and riches and, and your life will prosper and there will be no, no trouble, no suffering to come upon you. Uh, Christ is also taught as, you know, the remover of anxieties, the remover of depression, which he does do that in a sense, but that's not the sole teachings of Scripture. Scripture teaches that you will suffer persecution. You remember Jesus' words in John 15, 18, verse through 20, that if the, if the world hates you, remember first that it hated me. That remember the words that I say to you, he said in, in I believe, is verse 20, that, that um, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. It's a concept that's foreign to us in our American church, that we won't suffer persecution, that we won't suffer in any way for our faith. We, we kind of like to look at the, the good side of, of Christianity, but we don't like to look at the bad side. Or I don't want to say the bad side, if you will. That's a, maybe a wrong expression. But we don't want to look at the sufferings and what we consider the bad side, the hard, uh, the, the enduring that we will have to do as a Christian. You see, because when you look at a soldier's life and a good soldier, he says here, you suffer hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, I imagine Paul, Paul has been around soldiers for a good extent of his life. In fact, you remember when in Acts 23, when Claudius Lysia sent Paul to Caesarea, it says that he was sent with what is it, uh, 200 or 400 footmen? Four or 200, uh, uh, let me see exactly. I don't want to butch this up. Paul was around a massive amount of soldiers. Uh, 200, sir, for, forgive me. 200 footmen, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. That's how many soldiers Paul was around at one point in his life when he was sent to Caesarea. And so we see that Paul was no foreigner to what a good soldier looked like. Paul had a good idea of what good soldiers looked like. And, and a good soldier, one of the markings of a good soldier was discipline. One of the markings of, of a Roman soldier, in fact, was discipline. And, and allow me to read from Josephus. And, and Josephus describes, um, in the wars of the Jews, he describes the life of a Roman soldier. And allow me to read it. Each soldier every day throws his energy into his drills as though they were in action. Hence, the perfect ease when the time of battle shook. There was no confusion of the customary formations. There was no panic of paralyze. There was no fatigue of exhaustion. All of their camp duties, all of their duties that were not in warfare were performed as the same discipline as if they were. That was the kind of soldier that Paul was around. A Roman soldier who, in fact, Roman soldiers were, were disciplined very severely um, if they broke down certain ranks in their lives. The discipline that came in a Roman soldier's life was exemplary to, to just uh, an army in general, but exemplary to their own life of, of who they were as a person. And, and um, who is it? I believe George Washington once said that, that discipline brings unity, which is the soul of an army and so my point in bringing this up is that Paul was around good soldiers Paul seen what a good soldier looked like for the emperor of Rome and he's describing that we as Christians are called to be these same kind of good soldiers that we are called to 
to act like a soldier would act. And a soldier acts with removing himself so that he can first live for his comrades, he can live for his co-soldiers, but also that he can live to fulfill the command of the one who enlisted him. As we're going to see in the next verse, the next verse reads that no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a good soldier. No one engaged in warfare. You see, some believers um, think that they're not fighting a fight. What I mean by that is some of them think that they're not on the front lines of a battle. They look at their Christian life as they don't look at it as warfare, as a battle. You see, because as, as a Christian, there's one thing that you need to understand in this life as a Christian is you are either engaged in perpetual warfare or you're either engaged in perpetual preparation for warfare. You are never, there is never any downtime. And that's the picture here of a soldier. No one engaged in warfare. A soldier, when engaged in warfare, there is no downtime. He never says, let me take a time out. When you are in active warfare, when you are in battle, you cannot pause. You cannot say to your commander, let me hang out real quick during this battle while you guys go into battle. Let me sit in the back. Let me sit in the back of the trenches while this is going on. No, you are constantly on the front line. And that is true for the Christian. The Christian that doesn't understand that is a Christian who is asleep at his post. He's not recognizing that he is in a battle. And the sad thing is there's one truth in life, especially when it comes to warfare for a Christian, is that you are either killing sin or sin is killing you. And that is one thing that some Christians don't fully understand. We need to understand that this is the battle that we are fighting in our lives. And it's a short battle, in fact. The Bible talks about our lives being very short. But nonetheless, the Christian is not to be entangled or engaged in warfare and entangles himself, not to be entangled himself with the affairs of this life. I like that picture. The, that word entangle um, is, is, the Greek word is to intertwine. And it's the same word that was used uh, um, in Matthew 27 when it talks about the Roman soldiers entwining or, or, or twining, a, um, entangling uh, the crown of thorns. The idea is to braid when you braid something. So a good soldier is not to entangle himself with the affairs of this life. I like that word picture because there are some things in life that are not necessarily bad. And, and even for soldiers, when a soldier goes out to battle, there are things in his life that are not necessarily bad. Um, his wife, his children, those are not bad things for a soldier to be thinking about. But they become bad when that's all he's thinking about. When all he's thinking about is his wife and his children while he is out to battle, he's not thinking about those next to him who are battling with him. He's not thinking about the commands of the one who enlisted him. And his mind is elsewhere. He doesn't have that singleness of purpose. You see, and Jesus says, if if you love father and mother, if you love children, your, your children more than me, you are not worthy of me. And that's also not to say that there isn't a flip side to that, that when we focus on on our children, you know, in a sense, or or our wife in a sense, not to where we put them into the extent of above Christ, but when we focus on that we are living, in a sense, our Christian life for others, we're living it for for the benefit of our wives or our children, the idea becomes a motivator in the same coin, if you will, that we begin to, to... I realize that I need to study, I need to pray, I need to 
be closer to God on a daily basis, drawing near to God on a daily basis for the sake of my wife, of my children, of those I'm laboring with. And this is a good measuring rod for the Christian. This, this verse here is a good measure to put yourself because there's an application that we can see in it. And the application is, what entangles me? Or, or, or another question, have I become entangled with civilian affairs? You see, because the person who is, who is entangled with this world is ill-prepared for the next one. And we have to understand, like I said, there are, not, there are things that are not necessarily bad. There are things in this world like hobbies and, and social media or whatever it is that aren't necessarily bad, but when they become entangling, and what I mean by entangling, what the scripture here means by entangling, is when they restrict us, when they control us. You see, we're called as Christians to, to be in the world but not be a part of the world. And that's the sense here. We're called to be involved in the world, involved in civilian affairs, but we're called not to be entangled by them. They are not to control us. They are not to have precedent in our life. And, and that's the same that, that is true in every aspect of our life. What do we love most in our lives? I think Thomas Gunthry put it best when he said that he said that if any of you loves any pleasure better than prayer, any book better than the Bible, any person better than Christ, any indulgence better than the hope of heaven, be alarmed, for you have become entangled. You see, and that's the idea of what an entanglement means, something that controls you, something that takes over your life. You know, I think of the Pharisees in, in Luke eleven forty three, 43, where Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogue and, and you love the respectful greetings at the marketplace. I think of that because that word love there that Jesus uses in Luke is the word agape. You selflessly, unconditionally love these things. And that's the idea of entanglement in our own lives. What do we love most is the question. And we can see the things that we love most. First of all, we know in our own heart the things that we love most. We, we, we're, we're, we're not deceived very often at what we love most. Or, or I hope we're not. I hope we have enough sense to realize what we love most. But we can also see by what we love most. You know, people say to check out what a man loves most. Look at his bank account. Um. I think what a person loves most, look at his time. What does he invest his time in? What is your time invested in on a daily basis? Because that's where we'll discover what we love most. Or that's what we're saying we love most. When we invest our time, and, and, and investing our time in, in, in everyday matters of, of Christ is what we're called to do. That's where, where we're called not to be entangled, but involved. We're involved in these things, like for instance, social media. I recently got a social media. Never had one. But I'm in, involved in it, and I'm engaged in it for Christ. I, I'm using it as, as, a, as a platform for, for furthering the gospel, for, for doing the work of the kingdom. But I'm not entangled in it where it's consuming my life and it's taking me down this path of where it, it, it separates my time from the things that are most important in my life. And so there's the idea between being involved in something but not to be entangled with something. And, you know, there's a, there's a perfect picture of this involvement entanglement and if you will if you, if you have a bible flip over uh to genesis with me genesis 13 and, and i'm just going to jump on on verses so if you're taking notes I, I encourage you to write these notes down these, these verses down the first verse is, is in chapter 10 i'm sorry in verse chapter 13 verse 10 of genesis 
And it says that Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So the first thing that, that, that Lot does is he looks to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, flip over to, or go down to verse 12. And it says that uh, the, the second half of verse 12, Lot dwelt in the city of the plains and pit, pitched his tents as far as Sodom. So he, he placed his tents near Sodom. Now, if you flip over to chapter 14, you'll see in verse 12, they also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Now, so you see that Lot went from looking at Sodom to placing his tents near Sodom to finally dwelling in Sodom. That is the perfect picture of the pernicious element of being entangled in this life. The idea that the Christian lives in the world, but that he is not letting the world live in him. You see, a boat in, a, in water is by design, but water in a boat is a disaster. And you realize that you are entangled when your possessions are possessing you just the way it happened with Lot. And so it's a good picture of what it means to be entangled. And so therefore do not be entangled with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a good soldier. Now that's the question, and, and, and I just want to close with this on this verse, is that uh, to ask yourself an applicational question, what does your military service look like to Christ? Do you, are you a wall? Are you absent without leave as a soldier for Christ? Or are you like I believe many in the, the American culture are doing? Are you, um, are you playing toy soldiers? When you look at this verse. Because remember, like I said, this is, these are the last words of Paul. These are the last words that Paul I, I don't want you to be deceived. And what I mean by that is that Paul felt it necessary to add these words in his last epistle, in his last record. He knew he was going to die. When you know you're going to die, you don't mince words. You don't just add words just for fun. You add them for a specific reason and a purpose. And that's what Paul is doing here. He is showing your life is like that of a soldier. Now, are you playing toy soldiers as a Christian or are you act actively engaged in the warfare that is before you? Like I said, are you, are, are you perpetually in warfare or are you perpetually in preparation? Because you should be in those things as a Christian. You should be engaged in something Regarding, regarding the warfare of your Christian life. For if you're not, you're, you're AWOL or you're just playing toy soldiers as a Christian. You're not being or taking your life, your, your walk with God seriously. The way a soldier takes his, first of all, the way he takes his military practice, the way he takes his, his um, drills seriously. If you look at any branch of the military, they take their drilling very seriously. And, and, and that's a good picture for us here. Is that when you look at drilling, when you look at marching from a, a military standpoint, it's a, it's a very mundane, it's a very base uh, um, exercise. You know, they, they, that's one of the first things they learn when they're in boot camp, how to drill, how to march. And yet, that little exercise there teaches them how to be an impenetrable unit, how to think and look like a unit. And, and, and that's another thing that I think that you learn from this word picture. And something that I stress so much in my teachings that the Christian life is never meant to be lived alone. It was never designed 
to be lived alone. Christianity without discipleship is Christianity without Christ. It is designed to live, or you are designed as a Christian to disciple or, or labor alongside of your brother and sister in Christ. But let's move on to the next one. Verse 5, and if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Competes in athletics. I think what's interesting is that in, in, in ancient uh, Greece, there was three requirements for somebody to compete in athletics. First of all, he had to be a true-born Greek to compete in the Olympics. He had to be a true-born Greek. He had to um, dedicate or, or, or say an oath to, to a god that he was worshiping because back then, the Olympics and athletics was much like modern sports today. It's a religion. Uh, it was something that you'd done religiously, just the way we do it in, in our modern culture today. We religiously watch our sports. But it was more so of a religion where they would make a sacrifice to a certain god. And finally, the third is that they had to follow the rules of that particular sport, that particular event. So in wrestling, you, you, I believe you weren't allowed to uh, kick somebody in the stomach. And so you had to follow those particular rules. I bring that up because it's kind of interesting that as, as Christians, there seem to be three kind of overall arching rules. One, you have to be born again. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 3, that unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, two, you have to say an oath. Romans chapter 10, you have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart. And then you have to follow the rules. What are the rules? The rules of scripture that are laid out before you. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now those are, that's the law is fulfilled in all those rules. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, but you also have to discern. You have to be a discerner that you may exercise your senses. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Exercise your senses that you will be able to discern what is good and evil. And that's the idea of an athlete. An athlete doesn't just put anything in his body. He puts good, solid foods in his body so that he can perform well. And that's the same idea of a Christian. We are not to just put anything in our bodies. We are to put what helps us to perform well. That's the trouble with so many Christians is they don't know what to put in their bodies. And, and this is what I like. This is the word picture that I like of this idea of athletics is that in the ancient culture, you were often coached by past victors. So past people who coached uh, or past people who lived out these Olympics often coached these victors. And that's the idea, and that's the same idea that should be in the Christian church today. We should be coaching those who, who come into Christ. Discipleship should be the energy and the force of our church. It should be the driving nature of our church. And that's what Paul here is talking about in chapter 2. The things that you have heard from me, verse 2, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. That's the idea that he's laying out in each of these pictures. Soldiers don't just wake up one day and become a soldier. No, they have to be trained by past soldiers. Athletes don't wake up one day and just think, I'm going to be an athlete. They have to be trained by past athletes, people who have done it before. A farmer, you don't just become a farmer. Even in our world today, farmers don't just become farmers. You have the farming, in fact, in our culture today, is a multi-generational concept. They are trained by people. And that is the idea here of athletics. You are trained by somebody, by a past victor, somebody who has gone before you, who can lay that out before you. A and it's a heartbreaking thing in our culture today, discipleship. It's a heartbreaking thing in our culture today. You know, I, I don't mean to knock anybody, but one of the most heartbreaking things is when you see somebody in our culture today who has been walking with the Lord 20, 30 plus years and yet doesn't know anything about the Lord, doesn't know anything about Scripture. 
It's a heartbreaking thing. And Paul, I, I believe, Paul even brings it up in, in Hebrews that we are called to move past the elementary principles of Christ. That you who have been in Christ ought to be teachers by now. But I find myself laying the elementary things before you. And that's the idea here as an athlete. We are called to lay that foundation, first of all, for those who come next. But we're also called um, to look up to those who have went before us as an athlete. That's the idea here that I get in, in this word picture. There's so many different uh, concepts and, and applications you can take away from the idea of an athlete. But that's one of the ones that I find so um, just relative to the church today. Discipleship. As a church, we should be actively um, engaging in discipleship. Raising up the youth. Raising up those who come to Christ. You know, I, um, it should not be left to a book or to a program or to a method but it should be left to men and women who are willing to to be be open armed to Christians and bring in their brothers and sisters raising them in athletics because that's the one thing about the athletics is that you can be a great athlete but if you don't have a good coach you might not go anywhere but it doesn't compete according to the rules that is one of the things that you have to, um, if you break the rules in sports, you're not crowned. You know, there's so many uh, examples, in our, even in our modern world, that when you partake in steroids or, or any other performance-enhancing drugs, y you're stripped of your, your title. I mean, look at, uh, uh, what was it, the, the, um, the Houston Astros. Couple was a couple of years back in their in their World Series that they had microphones in their your uniforms and they were banging on trash cans to tell them what was the pitch and they were not competing according to the rules and therefore they were they were stripped they were not crowned and that's the same concept in our own lives now what are the rules the rules are laid out before us in Scripture but it's also a matter of our hearts you see others see what you do but God sees why you do it and so we have to understand these rules, that these rules need to be formed with a good heart. Now finally, the thing of an athlete is discipline. An athlete needs to have in, in a, a tremendous amount of discipline. And, I, and I'm not going to go into depth on discipline, although I, 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 I love the idea of discipline in a Christian life. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. But I'm not going to go too in depth on it. But the one thing I want to focus on is that it's not, the discipline is not about, the, the, this is the one thing I want to focus on, is that in discipline, it's not about how you start, but how you finish. And that's one of the one things that rings true in the Christian life. And I think that's one of the things that Paul is talking about in this epistle. It's not about how you start, but how you finish. And we see people in Scripture, and probably the most prominent one is between Judges chapter 13 and through verse 16, is the, the life of Samson, who didn't compete according to the rules. Or at least he, he was undisciplined in his rules. And it, it, it got him a life of, of misery. He started off well, but he didn't end up pleasing God. And, or, I mean, he did at the end of his life, what he, his last act before God. But, but we see in Samson's life that it was a lack of discipline in his life. And the tragic thing is that so many Christians experience this same or imitate this same kind of walk. They... they they justify or they defend their sins and their lack of self-control and, and they're not living a disciplined life before Christ. You see, the Bible is, is filled with so many people with this tragic end. Saul's life. This idea of starting this race but not ending it well. And when you do so, you may not lose your salvation, but you lose your rewards. We're told in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 15, that in, in not finishing well, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you will possibly lose many of your rewards. 
Let's move forward. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. This word hardworking, the very root of the word, if you go to the base word, um, means to be weary. It means to be to the point of exhaustion. The hardworking farmer. You know what's really interesting or what I find interesting is that the Bible calls, or, or the Bible says that we are called to rest, that we will rest in Christ, right? That, that we will have rest. Uh, Hebrews talks about it. And yet, some of the most, or, or some people who have the most rest in Christ often seem to be the most restless. They often seem to be the most busy, busiest people. And that's this idea of the hardworking farmer. You see, when, when, in farming, you, you don't just cross your arms and hope that your crops are there. No, you, you have to be diligent about laying your crops. You have to be diligent about doing your homework and laying your crops. You have to understand that you need to till the ground. You need to work whenever it's raining, it's hot. You need to do all of these things, laying your seeds down so that your crops can be bountiful and that's the idea here of a hard work and that's the metaphor here of a christian life and and, you know what's pretty interesting about the farmer here is unlike the athlete or the soldier his life is mundane it's not very extravagant you see because in, in ancient times athletes were crowned and there was many people around them Soldiers would march into to the city after they have conquered it, and the crowds would go. The crowd of that empire would go wild, you know. And so, um, athletes and soldiers often had a good, you know, connotation to them. But a farmer was not necessarily like that. A farmer um, was more mundane, like I said, and there were no. There were no, um, um, there was no active fruitfulness, and what I mean by that, my point in saying this is, is what James talks about when he talks about a farmer. And here's what it is: James chapter five, verse seven. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. And so, one of the the distincting distinctive marks of a farmer is patience he was called to have patience knowing that he had seasons of fruitfulness and and i think that's an exhortation for some christians you know not all christians are 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 athletes or soldiers you know in a, in a sense of what i mean is that not all of them are called to extravagant positions you know where they're 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 constantly seeing the fruit of their labor. Some Christians have to labor long periods of time before they see that fruitfulness. I, I th- just think that's a, a neat picture. But nonetheless, verse 7, Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Now, I like this idea of consideration because now he's calling you to considerate, consider the three things that I just told you. The soldier who doesn't engage, you know, who engages in warfare but doesn't entangle himself. So a soldier who has a a singleness of purpose, a singleness of mind. Then he tells you the athlete who competes according to the rules. So he's a disciplined athlete. He has to subject himself to, to discipline so that he can live out these rules. And then finally, the farmer who needs to have patience in his crops. And those are three pretty r- relevant and very prevalent examples to the Christian life. And we're to have a singleness of purpose, that we're to have a disciplined life, and that we're to have patience in our life. Now, those are just things that I have expounded upon these, these texts, upon these verses. But God is calling you to do it because there's so much more there that we can spend countless amounts of teachings on expounding upon what it means to be a soldier what it means to be an athlete what it means to be 
a farmer. And that's why Paul says, consider what I say. This consider here is a command. It's in the present tense. It means actively do this. It's in, I believe it's in the imperative mood. The idea is that you will constantly be considering this. It's not just a passing glance. Reading it is not enough. You need to consider, you need to meditate upon it. That's a, uh, this is my final, this is what I want to close with, is that it's, it's often a concept that's foreign to some of us as, as Christians and as believers. We think that we need to read the Bible. And, and, and I'm not saying don't read the Bible. That is one of the things we need to do. But we think that that's enough. You know, we make our go through the Bible in a year charts and we check off. I'm reading this passage. I'm reading this verse so that I can fulfill my reading in a year. And that's not the idea that God had behind it. When he says read it, he means consider it, ponder it. It's not just a glance that you're looking at. You need to chew on it. Because the key to transformation, the key to being transformed or the, the, uh, the transformation life is meditation. That's the key to transformation. Meditation. Meditating upon the Word of God so that these uh, truths would penetrate in your life and that these doctrines would come directly from God. That you would understand them directly from the Lord as you meditate on these things. Because only when you meditate can you begin to truly understand what God is actually saying. If you're just reading the Bible just to check off your, your checklist, you're not fully grasping what God is trying to say. You see, because meditation is the bridge or is, is the gap between meaningful obedience. It's only then that you can truly uh, be obedient to God through fully understanding his word because when you don't understand his word and you're just living it out that's called legalism you're not understanding why you're living it out remember what i said earlier that others see what you do god sees why you do it and that's the idea behind meditation we meditate so that we can know more of god and why we are living the way we're living God bless you guys, and I'll be with you next time.